So, um, well, thank you for inviting me to actually give the introduction to this, uh, to the CIDR meeting here, at, at least to the observational section of it. It's very exciting because looking into the epoch of realization is the early phases of what's going on in galaxy evolution. And it's a very exciting topic. And I also have to say, I'm very much appreciating the whole organization behind running this meeting because we are in difficult times and it's um, get, getting the scientific exchange is essential for the progress. And therefore it's very nice that at least like we're able to actually maintain, um, maintain this through, uh, through the, all these online opportunities and that. So the focus is on the cold ISM, the cold interstellar medium during the epoch organization. And there's been immense effort going on in the past couple of decades in pushing this forward. Um, and I, I have less than 25 minutes left by now and I cannot do justice to all the different parts of it. Um, so you will probably find that my introduction is a bit biased, um, but I try anyway to sort of go somewhat broad in this and give you some of the aspects that I think are uh, important for understanding not just why we care about this but also what are some of the effects that um, it affects our understanding of what we're actually seeing in our observations. So just to set the, set the stage, here's a, this one of those famous nonlinear plots of the history of the universe starting from the Big Bang and going up till today. And basically, even having almost 14 billion years of history of the universe, basically in plot like this, the epoch organization takes a very substantial part of the time displayed here. But in fact, we're looking at a time that's less than a billion years after the Big Bang, so essentially beyond Reg of Six, if we're just talking strictly about the epoch organization. But of course, one can draw this into a little bit the time that comes after this. So we start out from a universe today where we have um, more than 13 billion years of galaxy evolution, which started back from the time of the Big Bang and shortly after the Big Bang at the, uh, at the time of the recombination, we got basically hydrogen and helium, a little bit of lithium. We didn't have all the elements that we see today. They have come through the processing that the nuclear synthesis and the stars that has been growing or the stellar mass that's been growing in the galaxies that we're seeing. And of course, we also got the cosmic macro background radiation, which of course affects us and affects what we're actually seeing in the high rate of universe. Now, the first galaxy, stars and galaxies probably started somewhere around maybe 200 or 300 million years after the Big Bang with the early formation of these. However, this is a completely, this is a topic on its own. And I know there's been a previous meeting on this. So I think if you're interested, you might be actually be able to go back and find some of the recordings of this. But if you now move further on, trying to actually see how far are we actually seeing, how distant are we seeing, and some of the most distant candidates we have now are out to about redshift 11, unless I missed that maybe something new came up more recently. Um, and so we're pushing the frontier of what we're able to see. And we're doing this both by looking at galaxies of various types, um, um, but also not just strictly galaxies, but also looking for quasars and AGNs. And of course, the brighter the object, the easier it is to see it far away, but there's also other effects that actually, um, so, uh, that I will cover a bit as I talk um, about what, how far we actually able to see. Um, let's see. So if we think about galaxies, galaxies are stars, gas, dark matter, etc. And they're not closed systems. They have an interaction with the surroundings. And so one of the questions is, why do we care about the cold ISM and why do we do this during the epoch of realization? Well, the stars we're seeing in the early galaxies, of course, formed out of the gas that is around them. And of course, the gas has to be in a state and have a conditions where you can actually do star formation. In the stars, we have the nuclear synthesis. We have a return of matter to the interstellar medium. But the interstellar medium, of course, as a set galaxy is not closed boxes. There is an there is an inflow of gas that comes from the circumgalactic and the intergalactic medium, but we also have outflows. We have return of gas back out, out, out of the galaxy. So we have a feed, feedback process that takes place as well. And of course, the epoch of realization is the time where the intergalactic medium goes through this phase transition of having been neutral to being ionized. That means we also need to have photons escaping from these early galaxies. And so you, ultraviolet photons need to reach from the galaxies, from the young stars and AGN out in 
all the way out of the galaxies. And that, of course, is very affected by what is happening in the interstellar medium. For example, dust obscuration could play a major role here. So why do we care about the cold uh, interstellar medium? Well, this is the fuel for the star formation. It's also the fuel for the uh, growth of supermassive black holes. It is the interstellar medium represents basically the recycled dump of galaxies. So it's a cosmic, we have stars are formed, they die, they return their matter, new stars are formed, etc. cetera. Uh, and of course, this is also how the gas that's been enriched with like increasing metallicity gets not just redistributed within the galaxies, but also gets removed out of the galaxies. And so we also experience this in an outflow, we have the feedback processes. So the ISM is also a really good probe for what are the heating processes and the cooling processes. And for example, we can use this to get an estimate of what is the UV radiation that is coming from the young stars. And again, I emphasize with the epoch ionization, this is really important because we want to understand how does the UV escape. So from an observational point of view, we can use the gas observations to understand and probe a lot of different things. One of them are the kinematics of like how the gas is moving about. But it could also be the excitation uh, conditions. We can measure the masses of the, uh, of the molecular gas, the atomic gas, the dust, etc. And so it gives us an idea of what is the current state of each of the galaxies we might be looking at. On the other hand, specifically ISM in the epoch organization, as I said before, we want to understand, for example, the impact of the UV radiation so that we have the coupling out of the galaxies. It, but it also represents really the early stages of galaxy formation. So basically, this is where we lay the foundation for everything we see in the coming 13 billion years. Um, and again, as I said, for the enrichment of the circumgalactic and intergalactic medium. So it's also really important that we understand in this epoch, how do we translate between our observational results and the physical properties? Because this might not necessarily be exactly the same formalism that we are using. Uh, between as we would be using in the local universe. Some of the relations that we find from the local universe galaxies might not hold for the high rate of universe. Some of that, like in principle, physics is the same, but it might be that the conditions uh, is such that galaxies will appear differently. So I'm gonna, like, there's been a lot of results coming out and I'm just gonna pick some different ones to sort of showcase um, a little bit about the different progress that's been. And so here I'm just showing just one of the very first results that came out of dust and gas detection from Unresh of six. And so this is from the Sloan um, uh, Quasar J1148, which was a reg of 6.4, which was one of the first dust detections of that uh, in that epoch. This was, um, of course, this is a quasar. It was a very, very bright, it's a very massive system. And let alone finding such um, massive supermassive black holes at that early epoch is, is quite spectacular and is very spectacular. And I know there's been yet another meeting also on uh, quasars during the ER. Uh, so I won't go into the details about that, but I just want to highlight here that finding dust masses that are equivalent or similar, or even higher than what we find in, for example, the Milky Way is quite important. And so already in uh, 2003 and 2004, finding a, a little bit against what were the initial predictions or maybe expectations where it should be possible to find so much dust at that time, there was actually detections and again, more detections have come afterwards. So of course, it's very easy to start on the bright end, looking at quasars and looking at extreme starbursts and seeing that something is happening. But of course, we want to understand what's going on much more generally for the kinds of all kinds of galaxies. And so I've been doing galaxy galaxies for many years now. And one of the things that makes it actually, I think, quite fun, uh, particularly interesting, was about looking for dusty galaxies is that we, this is this particular like, feature that we call the negative K correction. And so this is uh, what I want to illustrate here is actually taking a, a, a slide taken from, or a figure taken from a recent review by Jackie Hutt and uh, Elizabeth de Cunha, um, where the point I want to make here is that if you take an SED, this is a model SED they've done, it's been redshifted between redshift 1.0 from 1 and up to 10. And if you look here in the range that is the submillimeter and millimeter part, you'll find, see that even having a galaxy SED for the same luminosity, just by redshifting it and going up the radio gene slope, effectively have the same flux density measurements uh, for, for the same luminosity in this range. And it means that if, if, if dust rich galaxies exist at high redshift, very even the, into the ER, we will actually be able to see them. Um, simply just because it's not just that they are farther away and therefore fainter, we actually have a little bit of help from the SED shape. 
And there's been numerous uh, surveys doing this. And one of the very recent ones I'd like to highlight here is the two millimeter survey, the Mora survey uh, from Savala and Casey et al, where by pushing in to really high redshift and doing more systematic observations, it's actually possible to put both get detections, but also put constraints on what is the relative contribution between the unobscured star formation and the dust obscured star formation. And so based on this survey, which this is still probing the brighter end, uh, but it gives a very good indication. The plot here has the, the relative contribution by the obscured and unobscured um, um, star formation, both in the middle panel, but also the lower panel, which shows the cosmic star formation history. And you can see as you're going to higher redshift, the unobscured star formation play a relatively larger role. And this, of course, was has been a very big discussion for the past two decades of actually trying to understand how much are we seeing when we probe up from the the, from the optical new observations versus when we're, how much do we get from looking in the dust observations. And so now, of course, what remains here is filling, on, filling this up with deeper surveys and getting uh, a more complete picture across the luminosity range. Now, another really important aspect that I also mentioned before is the cosmic microwave background radiation, because Today we have a CMB temperature on 2.7 kelvins, but of course this scales with one plus, plus the redshift. And so beyond redshift six, the CMB temperature is larger than 20 kelvin. Now this is the moment where most of you will be thinking that still not, doesn't feel very high, but if you look at the cold interstellar medium where we have temperatures, say about um, 20 kelvin, 40 kelvin, 60 kelvin, etc. this actually becomes a significant heating contribution. And so this is, can be a significant effect. It will not always be a significant effect, but it will, it is not something that could be neglected when we talk about the epoch of realization. There's a number of papers. Sorry about that. There's a number of papers talking about this. And one of the, one of the very important ones is uh, from the Kunya et al. It's done extensive modeling of this and also developed a framework that is very often being used for correcting for the, uh, um, or taking into account the CMB uh, heating. And so I was taking a couple of plots from that paper to sort of highlight the effects that the CMB can have, again, said on this framework that she developed. Um, and on the left side, you have here a dust, a, a dust component which has a temperature around 18 Kelvin. But if you go beyond red to six, you can see that the CMB actually contributes to heating and therefore the actual temperature of the dust component will be larger. Now, what does this mean in terms of observations is taking a similar type of thing here is on this is so this is an SAD that sat and uh, including the fact of the uh, CMB. So the gray one here is just the intrinsic SED modified black body without the effect of the, cusp uh, of the CMB. Now, including heating from the CMB, it would be more like the black line here. Uh, but of course, when we observe it, we're seeing it in contrast. We have to see it as a contrast up against the CMB background. And therefore, we'll, again, it will look different from what it in fact is. And this is reflected in the, uh, in the dashed line here. So dust observations and the epoch of realization will, depending on the intrinsic temperature, will be affected to some degree by CMB heating and therefore observations will be affected by this. The colored lines that are here in the, uh, um, the vertical lines reflect the different alma bands. Now, it's not just the dust, it's also the CO observations or basically some of the molecular lines that are affected. But CO, since this is one of the most common lines for extragalactic people to trace the molecular gas, uh, of taking one of the uh, figures from that paper to illustrate this. And again, if we have a, a component with different kinetic temperatures here with the blue, red, and yellow um, highlighted here, then the different, going to progress with higher redshift will affect how we see the line SED for these sources. In this case, it's the LTE case. If one takes a non-LTE case, the, it becomes even more complex. But they're just a kind reminder that CMB plays a role both in what happens in the ISM, but it also plays a role how we interpret our data. Now, dust detections have, I showed before, there was one of the quasars, one of the first ones, but they, they, they're coming in gradually a bit at the time. Uh, and here I have just a very small compilation. There are several more detections in the literature, but showing both from the right side where I've put the quasars and AGNs as some example, in the middle having brighter galaxies, starburst-like um, um, uh, sources, 
And then to the left side, I put lens galaxies to illustrate the low mass and the low star formation rate um, systems. And those are, again, to be unique to go through the lensing to actually probe these. And what's quite remarkable is that we're actually finding uh, dust masses that are like 10 to the seven solar masses or more. And again, I just remind this is basically equivalent to what we have in our own Milky Way. But a lot of effort is going into understanding where does this dust come from? How does it survive in this environment? Or, or how does it get reprocessed? How do the dust grains grow, et cetera? And there's a lot of, um, um, there's a lot of funding being rewarded to this at the moment. Several places, I can see several groups have been posting positions at the moment because um, to actually study this. And so we're seeing more and more dust. That's exciting. But I think there's another aspect which is equally exciting is that we're seeing a large number of non detections for dust. And part of this, is, of course, reflects maybe the depth to which we're actually having like the sensitivity of the observations. But it also reflects that there's probably something we don't understand about dust. It's either because the metallicity is lower and therefore there will be less material available for actually making the dust grains and growing them. But it could also reflect that there are other aspects that we haven't understood about the physical conditions or the properties of the gas. And one of these could be that, for, and this is just an example I took from the literature from Feistadel, is that the temperature might be different. Of course, this is very difficult to determine uh, just sort of from one or two um, photometric data points. So it could be that we are either because ours, we don't have enough data to make this constraints, but it could also be that the, phys like the, that the physics actually says that the temperature will be significantly higher for the, because of the early stages of the galaxy formation or galaxy evolution. Um, so what I want to highlight with this plot is, is that given the big error bars that are here trying to actually make the estimate on uh, what are the dust temperature and what, how to well best to characterize the dust SEDs, is very, very difficult and therefore we're, this, this is not a settled topic but it's opening up another big question like set of questions so i think in the next five years when samples will be growing we'll also be getting a much better handle on this and this of course is essential input towards what's happening on the modeling side as well um but of course dust is mostly something we observe in the continuum and i have to admit here as well that what I'm showing, we, we studied the ISM across the whole electromagnetic spectrum, in particular in the optical infrared millimeter and into the radio. But my view here, what I'm presenting, and the last part of my talk was, was very biased towards the, the far infrared and millimeter part. So it's not that I've forgotten that we can see the ISM across the whole spectrum. It's just that um, like we're limited in time. And I think that what, a lot of the progress that's been happening over the past few years has actually been the delivery of data from ALMA and other millimeter observatories. So looking at the spectra, we can actually look at different spectral lines. And this gives them really opens up uh, opportunities of seeing details that we otherwise wouldn't be seeing. Um, there's a lot of different spectral lines. The carbon monoxide CO has been probably like the most common tracer. I said that before as well. And here's a plot that I took from Carillion Walter uh, review from 2013. I forgot to put in the reference. I apologize for that. But the what you're seeing here is the um, the different CO transitions, different J transitions, as they're being redshifted through the different bands. And here's the ALMA bands, it's the VLA bands. I put ALMA here and VLA just to help indicate. And you can see that when we get out beyond redshift six or just to high redshift, it's basically just the high J transitions we're seeing with ALMA. So if we have to see the low J transitions, we have to go to the VLA. And of course, um, keeping in mind that the low J transitions have excitation temperatures comparable to that of the CMB, that of course is also significantly challenged. Um, so that can be very difficult. We also have another part of the spectrum, which is very exciting, which is the fine structure lines that are seen in the far infrared. So these are atomic lines from neutral and ionized gas. Uh, and there again, similar kind of plot, we see how the transitions redshift out through um, um, that gets redshifted through the different bands. Here are the ALMA bands and here are the VLA bands. Below here is more of the dense gas tracers like ATN and ATO plus, but I like to focus at the top with the fine infrastructure lines here. And so one of the ones that have been discussed a lot is using carbon plus, so ionized carbon uh, as a probe for a lot of things. And the reason for this is that it is a very, one of the brightest cooling lines we see in local star forming galaxies. 
Um, and that, of course, can be used as a tracer tra 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 of various aspects of what's happening. And of course, we're also interested in getting, for example, the carbon one line. And if you can get a combination of these, it's maybe a good probe for finding the total molecular gas mass. And I think this will also be discussed in one of the future talks here. Of course, if one can get the combination of all these lines, we can do a lot more. Um, so here's a figure just to illustrate this that I've taken from the very recent paper by Matt Nadal. And I want to use this one just as a, um, a, a way in to um, illustrate, for example, the uses of carbon plus or C2 uh, observations, but also again, reminding you that it's particularly if we have low metallicity environments, this, the situation could be remarkably different from what we see in just normal metallicity environments. And so what the illustration has here are like bright stars in the middle, the young stars as a UV, UV radiation field. And then molecular cloud, where we very often would assume that the carbon monoxide will be tracing the H2 uh, uh, gas quite well. But if you have a low metallicity environment, this is probably not the case. There might only be a limited amount of CO, but there will still be a big reservoir of H2. And therefore, actually, the, uh, the atomic carbon might be the better way to trace this. Um, so just taken from the local universe literature, here are a couple of examples showing how the carbon plus in comparison to a number of other traces, uh, for example, uh, the fine infrared uh, emission or uh, using other traces for looking at the star formation rate, actually finding that there is a good correlation or some kind of clear relation between star formation rate and uh, line luminosity. And this goes both for the carbon plus, but also for some of the other fine for structure lines, fine for red fine structure lines. Um, so it was suggested that carbon plus will basically be one of the best tools for us to understand galaxies uh, in the uh, in in the EOR, because it's redshifted, the line is redshifted into uh, the millimeter band, so it's very easy to observe from the ground. And there had been a couple of the heads at that point, also been a few different detections, but still limited to very few uh, sources. So in in 2015, K. Uh, published a um, a paper with results from redshift five to six, and uh, this was the first bigger sample with 10 sources were all with carbon plus detections and some of them also will continue in data. And stepping on from there, it's been, the number of detections has been growing. Again, most of them are individual sources. Most publications have one, two or three detections each, but this is slowly growing into becoming more systematic surveys. And I note that there are actually very big surveys that are coming out now in particular from the ALMA large programs. So from Alpine, which I think there will be a little bit more about later, the Alma Lenten cluster survey, which is also represented here. And then there's the rebels as well. And the difference is a little bit the redshift range, but also the parameter space that's being probed because the Lenten clusters will probe the somewhat lower mass and lower star formation range range, while the galaxies that are individual fields will be probing, um, they're, they're not typically not lens, they'll never be probing sort of the slightly brighter end. Now, comparing the line luminosity of carbon plus to the star formation rate, uh, plotted up, this is a diagram from Harry Canada, and there is lots of these diagrams in the literature. Um, comparing the local relations from the low all, it's seen that on the brighter end, things sort of compare well between the high rate of the local, local high rate of universe and low rate of universe. But if we go to the lower part of the parameter space with a lower star formation rate, we're actually seeing that, they're, that this, the galaxies tend to be under luminous, under luminous in their line luminosity. And so this has been a really important result. And uh, there's a major effort also on the modeling side going into actually understanding how well can we use, like, but, but what, what does this actually tell us? Uh, so there's not quite forward and stra straightforward with the interpretation of this, but I think this is opening up uh, is a really important aspect of understanding the early stages of galaxy evolution, at least the conditions of what's happening in the heating and cooling processes of the ISM, but also the effect of, for example, metallicity. Uh, so this is where we're going to see a lot of progress in the next few years. There's but two, two yes, minutes left. thank you. So going from the carbon plus into the uh, other traces, we have the oxygen three, for example. And this is also where, again, there are no major systematic surveys on this. I expect five years from now, giving this in talk, we'll have major systematic surveys on this. But it's very difficult because, again, we need a lot of observing time for a lot of sources. 
Uh, but, but it's coming, it's growing there. There's a few examples that I want to highlight here. But again, having single line studies versus not as much single source, but single line studies is, is nice, but it's more fun if you can put them together. And so here, just to make an example from, uh, from the Hardy Canada paper, they put the, the line ratios, uh, luminosity ratios here, and you can sort of see a tendency that the galaxies tend at, at the early part, uh, sorry, that was my own timer, um, that the, uh, that the luminosity, the oxygen three tend to be brighter while the carbon plus tend to be fainter. And of course, this can possibly be explained by trying to understand how different physical facts go. This could be the distribution of the gas, it could be the metallicity, it could be the ionization uh, fields, et cetera. Um, when I say ionization field, I mean like the UV radiation field as well. Um, so I'm not actually supposed to talk about models, but I did want to put in one of the models from uh, Katzadao for simulating a number of galaxies. Here's an example for a single galaxy in the simulations. Show how different traces, so different transitions. Here's the oxygen, the carbons over here, oxygen, nitrogen, nitrogen, etc. How for the same galaxy uh, in the process, like this is of course process simulations, um, they they look somewhat different, not fully different, but we'll be pr probing different parts of it. Some of it's probing the ionized gas, some of the neutral gas, some of the molecular gas. And therefore, we need to, the next really big step in order to make a significant progress in the next few years is actually getting this multi-transition studies as well. And there was very recently, just a couple of days ago in the literature, there was a redshift uh, 4.7 result that came out for BR1202, one of the big quasars that also has companion sources. There was oxygen one uh, results as well, which I thought was quite nice to see that like, the, but the, the, again, it's small steps, but this will actually at some point become much more systematic studies. And I think so that it's like, there's this really cool future ahead of us and how much we can do. So I'm just in the last 30, seconds or minutes, whatever I have, is talking about a little bit, what are some of the big challenges we have for understanding early galaxies? Uh, and it's not, it's, it's of course also from the observational point of view is that we have very short time scales, like compared to looking at galaxies today. But we also have, we don't know very well the star formation history and the initial mass function of what happens in the early phases of the galaxy evolution. We it's don't know how the-, the Time is up. Yes, okay. So metallicity enrichment is very important and also affects the dust production, which we'll hear more about later as well. And then the UV radiation field. So we're basically the connection between what happens in the small scales and the large scales. So I put up my summary, just reminding you that we have an increasing number of gas and dust detections. We have major challenges in understanding what's going on, which I think is pretty cool because it means that there is more opportunities for more stuff to learn. And then we have a really, in the outlook, we have a really bright future because we're now getting enough single studies that will help us define and actually understand better how to move ahead in major systematic studies. And of course, with Alma, the JWST, ELT, and SKA, I think we'll actually have um, the next five, 10 years will yield uh, uh, a very good understanding between the link between galaxy formation and the EOR. And of course, tomorrow will the model be really important. So I'll stop. Thank you, Kirsten. I think uh, we don't have any time for questions. If they're in the Slack, uh, I'll one. take I'll look at the Slack uh, channel. So. Yeah, maybe we can actually do one question by Bill Sang Yoon. Uh, how much do we understand the impact of cosmic ray in the EOR? I think that's an excellent question. And I don't think this has been studied quite as extensively as it's been studied as slightly lower redshift. Um, so I think this is a very important aspect to, to, to bring. I would actually ask the same question once more to the, to the people who do the simulations. Um, I think that's a very good point. Oh, thank you. There are one, there's one more question in the Slack. I guess you can ask it there. And thank you again. Yes, thank you. So while we're waiting for the next session, I just want to thank you, Kirsten. I think it was a really excellent talk. I understood a lot despite not being an observer. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> it's a, I think it's a very exciting epoch as well. I see there's a couple of questions. I'm uh, trying to answer those. Yes, yes, go ahead. But I, think, I actually think really like it's, there's going to be a lot happening in the next few years because the, the trick is to actually get the observing time on the big facilities. But I think also, I think what we need is a little bit more talk between the observers and the uh, people who do the modeling.
Yes, yes, I agree.